English. I don't think I could do it in Spanish. As a matter of fact, I had to hire someone to translate Looking for Esperanza into Spanish. I couldn't do it myself. And it also interesting because the plot de Esperanza, that would definitely be really interesting for the Spanish public. Yeah. Let, let's say that I hired someone to translate it and that she did a very poor job. So it was money that was wasted. Yeah. To give you an example, um, there are some things that she did a lot of transliteration, which is not a good idea, right? So I'd say um, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. You cannot say that in Spanish. It doesn't make sense. And she translated that into Spanish. We don't have that in Spanish. We have another one, a totally different one. So it just didn't make sense. <laughs> appreciation for everything that is put in front of them. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. okay. If we're good, um, I would like to read um, a little bit from my mother's funeral. When I was 13, um, I had a curfew, and one day I forgot my curfew because I was busy with Diego behind the stadium. <laughs> <laughs> when I got home very late, and rather than admitting that I had lost track of time, I just told my mom the most ridiculous <laughs> lie. I told my mom that I had been kidnapped. <laughs> <laughs> and it was one of those lies that you know it only gets worse <laughs> all the time. So it was like, who kidnapped you? like three guys in a car, three guys in a car, where did they take you? And because I couldn't make anything up, I told her that I had been drugged. Oh, no. oh. So the next day she took me to the doctor to make sure that I had not been violated, oh. right? And I had, um, the doctor examined me in front of my mom, oh. right? She wanted to make sure that I was still a virgin. So I would like to read. a little bit about that. <laughs> so I was still a virgin, right? That's the result. And after that, we go straight to the nearest church. We are alone, kneeling on a wooden pew, hands clasped below our chins, heads bowed before a colossal cross with a dark Jesus affixed to it. He's missing a toe. Probably he lost it during a, an Easter procession. Mom doesn't notice this or the donation box sitting at his feet with a handwritten note that reads, let's give our savior his toe back. <laughs> <laughs> Mom whispers prayers. She says that we need to thank God, her God, that those kidnappers didn't violate me. All I can think about is the missing toe and how disgusted I am at myself for making my mom sick with worry last night, for lying to my sisters, for let Diego touch my lemons, because they were called lemons. <laughs> I got what I deserved, me, little liar, me, me, little whore, me, me, puta. My mom is on her knees. Gracias, gracias, Dios mío, that my girl's still a virgin. Gracias, Jesus, for keeping her intact. Mom can't stop hugging me. She can't get enough of me, of this reassured me, of this shiny me and touch me that pleases her so. I knew it, I knew it, she says to herself and to me, and it given the chance to every passerby. I'm still a virgin, and that's all that matters. <laughs> virgin, intact, unadulterated. Mom says big words all meaning the same thing, and her words fit me perfectly. My private self has been identified. I have been branded virgin. God's goods con constantly monitor, 
future husband do not fear virgin under close inspection. I visualize this membrane inside me, this membrane that makes me what I am. I picture it as pink, thin, and translucent, like a bubble of strawberry gum, like a film of cotton candy, like a delicate Murano glass ball. Does it resonate like a drum if you tap it with your fingernails? Did the woman doctor strum it with her two gloved fingers? And if she did, was it prickly like the skin of a peach, bumpy like the underside of my tongue, sleek and bouncy like a trampoline in the rain? I feel as if I have morphed from being an invisible little girl into a woman with an identity, someone <coughs> whose best quality can finally be described, virgin. This transformation, this new definition of myself, propels me into an outer world. So this is what being a woman is all about. This is it, I think. No more hiccups of self-awareness. This time, the incline toward full womanhood is steady. I will never slip back. will never be free of this new me. I have a hidden trophy inside my crotch, something so valuable that in 13 years, it has been struck only by two latex fingers and seen in all its impish splendor only by mom. I have been brooding all day. By the time the sun sets behind the cordillera, I have a pixie haircut, wear a training bra made of cotton because mom says that silky underwear encourages precocious sexuality. <laughs> and my silky legs glisten with a hairless glow. Alone in the bathroom, I shaved my legs, cruelly depriving mom of a special occasion in our lives that she wanted to be a part of. I took that away from her maliciously, gladly, with swift razor runs up and down my legs, a simple act full of spite, an impulse born in the blur of the humiliation on the exam table, my private act of resistance, an urgent moment, uncontrollable and explosive like a spasm. Now we're even. Tonight, as I lean against the door jam in the bedroom mom and I share, I think of packing my clothes and running away. But I know I can get no farther than the closet with my clothes hung. I know I suffer from a hunger that, for now, only my family can quench. I know that if I had to choose between freedom and family, I'll choose the tyranny of mom's love and her futile women's counsels that have taught me nothing about democracy and everything about tenacity. Uh, we used, because we were five girls, so we used to have women's councils, that's what mom called them, <laughs> where we got together to decide everything, in theory, but she had already <laughs> made all the decisions. <laughs> we just got together to listen to my mom's decisions. <laughs> so I look at mom from the hallway, she's sitting in the dark, staring at our black and white TV set. I wonder if she's looking at her own reflection on the screen. Does she see the woman I see? Late 40s, dark half moons under her sad eyes, short gray hair, a permanent frown, dark and smiling lips, a haggard woman with nothing to show for a lifetime of diapers, late night colleagues, schools and paid bills, hunger, lies, loneliness. I walk to the couch and sit beside her. She puts her arm around me. For a while, I sit rigidly, but then I close my eyes ease against her, rest my head on her shoulder, and I feel like crying for her. I wish a new story, a secret recipe that I could give to her. I wish I could cradle her in my arms and tell her my secret. Tell her that she will wake up tomorrow stronger, better, without the uncertainty of loneliness, but somehow feeling that her life is something solid that she is carving. I wish this unnamed thing, which I do not possess but long to share with her, will fill her with renewed fortitude and get her ready to face the day, to steer the reins of its hours and claw its quotidian drabness and disembowel it until the day gives my mom the joy she deserves. But I have nothing to tell her, nothing to give her but the reaffirmation of my chastity. I sob quietly. Why are you crying, she whispers. I'm crying for you, mama. Well, that's silly, she says. Then she rises and says good night. How are we doing for time? Read more. <laughs>
And one of the things that um, I took the freedom of doing with the book <coughs> is imagine mm -hmm. lots of things about my mom. I imagine her wedding night. I imagined um, her honeymoon. And, um, and one of the things that I had to do, because I just had to do, was imagine um, the moments before she died. For me, it was important to imagine whether or not she had experienced pain, what had gone through her mind. And it was my way to cope with the loss, which was a huge loss. I picture her last night. I think she went to bed early. She was tired, and the real world had lost its luster a long time ago. I have to tell you this. This book became what it became because this man here turned a mess into something so beautiful. I have forgotten to say it. he edited my book. Such a beautiful job. It was just such a beautiful thing. Because I remember reading the manuscript, and what, what Barn did was say, he needs more here, he needs less here. That's what we were doing this morning, right? And he just filled gaps. He was like, give me more. You know it because this happened to you, but I don't know it. Give me more. And it just gave the whole manuscript to just a beautiful change. Thank you so much. From her apartment um, in, diap in diapasons, she could hear the life outside percolate into her room, the cacophony of Medellin, children playing, cars crunching gravel, sirens blaring in the distance, so much noise. People and their whims were also beginning to bother her. She often said, the more I get to know people, the more I love my dog. She never had a dog. <laughs> I think she pulled the covers over her head and breathed in the lavender fragrance of the sheets. As for herself, she no longer smelled of anything. She recalled the various aromas her body had given off over the years. Guava jelly when she was a little girl blood when she became a woman, the patchouli scent one of her children had given her for Mother's Day, the potpourri of her menopause. After that, nothing. Her body had become a dry river bend, riverbed, devoid of milk, blood, or sweat. Her body had become an inhabitable, a condemned house about to implode on its foundations. <coughs> she began her nightly prayers, dozing off, as she always did. And when she woke up a few minutes later, she tried to finish them, but she could not remember which one she had been saying was it not our Father or a Glory Be. One of these days, she used to say, I'm going to unscrew my head and give it a good wash inside. She was finding it more and more difficult to keep tabs on life. On life. The days of the week had become indistinguishable, church on Sundays, or is it Tuesdays? Grocery shopping on Wednesdays, or is it Saturdays? Her life was complicated by misplaced objects. Her brushes, reading glasses, house keys, all seemed to have terrible minds of their own. She meant to water her plants every other day, but that night she wasn't sure if he was keeping that schedule. She fell asleep, wishing for a better tomorrow. Tomorrow, she hoped, she would emerge from this chrysalis of gloom. She would wake up lighter, less clumsy, more nimble, less lost, more assertive, less tight-chested, freer. A noise woke her up. A black witch moth made its way into mom's room. It fluttered its wings against the walls. It hovered over the bed, the black eyes on its four wings watching mom, watching and waiting. Mom gasped for air, making snorts that she didn't recognize as her own. Something had locked beneath the sternum, obstructing her breathing. A surge of panic settled in her eyes. God, I can't breathe, she said between gasps. Swaths of color flashed in glittery snapshots of rain under her eyelids. She massaged her throat with one hand, then the other, then both. She pressed at her breastbone, my God. And whatever was lodged in her chest, began to expand and sharpen, clipping up her windpipe like a millipede. 
San Gregorio bendito, Virgen del Carmen, ánimas del purgatorio, don't abandon me. She repeated in her head like a mantra, invoking every one of her divine saviors. Her muscles hardened like cardboard left out to dry in the sun, and in a convulsive burst of speech, she called the living nurse, don't let me die, were the only words she managed to whisper. She threw a couple of slow motion punches at the nurse as though she was drowning in quicksand, then clutched the nurse's skirt. For a few seconds, the nurse wrestled with mom's grip. Do not let me die, she pleaded once more. Her whisper was almost inaudible. My mother's mouth made a silent, oh, in moribund exhalations of moist air. Her head launched up with an involuntary jerk, her body contorted with pain. She felt the nurse's hands on her chest, pressing on the sternum with little push-ups that burned my mother's skin. She heard the nurse fumble with the telephone. Words filled the room, mom, dying, come soon. You're not alone, the nurse said. I'm right here with you. She put her, arm, she put her arms around my mother. Mom began to snore a ragged, gurgling pattern of breathing typical of those who are about to die. Then her chest jolted as if she had been hit by lightning. A few seconds later came a weaker strike, followed by something similar to a quiet belch. Her jaw shifted south, then east, changing the geography of her face in quick succession. In her face was tension, then pain, then agony, then resignation. That was what the nurse saw from the outside, but inside mom, she felt something similar to drunkenness. Her head swelled and the crown relaxed and quivered, then melted into a blue sky. She was floating. Her thoughts were like fireworks exploding into each other. And in a flash of sparks, she found herself in the place she loved the most, Mariquita, her homeland. Here, in this place that smelled of avocado and earth after rain, she was no longer my mother. She was a woman. Finally, she was just Carmen. And I want to finish, just, it's just one and a half page. And I wrote this after the whole book had been written. This was um, pretty much an afterthought that it was necessary. Among Tibetan Buddhists, there is a burial custom known as Jator, in which mourners give alms to birds of prey and offer the body of the deceased to the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and air. The vultures are seen as sky dancers, angels that take the soul into heaven. Allowing the birds to eat the flesh of the dead guarantees a safe passage to that great windy place where souls are reincarnated. Jator is an act of love, a last gesture of compassion and generosity. A dead body is an empty vessel, therefore, preventing other creatures from feasting on it con is considered the ultimate display of selfishness, bad karma. When I, when a person dies, the body is cleaned, wrapped chin to knees in a seamless white cloth, and left untouched for three days. During this time, the soul starts its slow migration out of our realm. On the third day, at dawn, body breakers called rogiapas lay the body on a flat rock atop a hill and wrap it and dismember it. The flesh is offered first to the vultures, and after most of the flesh is gone, the rogiapas armed with mallets break the bones. They grind them with yak, butter, flour, and tea, and offer the pulp to the waiting smaller birds, crows, and hawks. Everything is consumed, everything is offered, everything is taken. I first learned about Jator when I was studying to become an anthropologist, and I immediately loved the idea. I imagined my own Jator. My body spread wide like a banquet, birds of all sizes landing on my chest, 
feeding off my thighs, my face, feathery creatures taken off from my navel and landing on the runway of my belly and later back, and later coming back for more. My remains would be delicious, transcendent, ripped into submission and garnished with the savory chemicals that body secretes after rigor mortis. For years, images of my own jator passed before my eyes and snapshots of morsels of me being whisked up into a vast sargasso of nothingness. Sharp beaks dredging residual chunks of me from the Mariana depths of my dry arteries. How beautiful. This is how I want to go. This is how everyone should go. I thought everyone should have a jator. Yet my fixation with sky burials disappeared when mom died. I came out of her body, and it was only after her death that I secretly claimed proprietorship over her flesh and her bones. I did not want her to be cremated or buried or embalmed. I didn't want her to be seen or touched. I didn't want anyone to utter her name. I didn't want her to be dead. There is beauty in imagined jators. In the funeral pyres I saw along the Ganges, in the fado songs of funerals in Portugal, in the recitation of the Kaddish, in faraway death rituals where the dead are strangers. But this was my mother's death, followed by a real wake, a real funeral, a real cremation. My sisters and I authorized the reduction of her body to a heap of ashes. None of it was imagined, and none of it was beautiful. Three days after her death, the only traces of her lay in a tiny wooden box, and we were about to leave the box behind. I volunteered to deposit the urn in the crypt. My sister had chosen an ossuary in the basement of a church. At the center, hanging low, was a wooden crucifix. I laid the box under the bloody feet of Jesus. With both hands on the box, I recited, a Buddhist prayer I had learned a long time ago. She has taken the great leap. The light of this world has faded for her. She has entered solitude with her karmic forces. She has gone into a vast silence. And as I say the word silence, I started to cry, and I felt as though I was about to break into bits that would never be reunited. Mom and I had been a unified whole. Without her, there was no me. A long time ago, I had heard a rabbi on the radio explain why Jews don't cremate their dead. He had said that a grave is a place where the soul of the deceased connects with ours, that we honor their memory by returning to the grave. <coughs> oh God, we cremated mom. We have no grave. He said that ashes are the destruction of a memory, a complete divorce of the soul from this world, an act that causes pain to the soul. I choked and began to cough, and the echoes bounced off the cavernous walls of the basement. Sobbing quietly, my sisters kept the distance. It was a Sunday, and a chill came over the basement like a shroud. I wanted to put mom under my sweater, sit with her in a corner of the ossuary, blow hot air onto the box, and cover it with my hair. I wanted to shield mom from the cold. Let her go, one of my sisters said. I stood up and pressed the box against my belly, rubbed it on my chest as close to my heart as possible. Then I carried the box with what was left of mom to her new home, little door number 07632. Holding my breath, I slipped the box into the crypt. I pushed it away from this world and into her new realm with a steady hand. The box made a shh sound as it slid out of my life. I locked the ossuary, put the key into my sweater pocket, and let out a sigh. My sisters and I locked arms, and together we climbed the stairs. We surrendered the ashes, and together we crossed that terrible threshold. We stood openly to the four elements, and together we faced the rest of our lives with the invisible scar. It was dark outside, and it was beginning to rain. I'm all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any warning that your mother was ill? 
No. She was good. She was good. And um, the irony was that she complained that she couldn't breathe and she couldn't breathe and the paramedics got tired of coming to the house and there was nothing. So the last EKG that she had, the paramedics said, you know, she has the heart of a 15 year old. She's gonna die of anything mm -hmm. but a heart. And she died two days after that. Oh. Yeah. So uh, I'm really taken with the, you know, the move to imagine in nonfiction. And I'm wondering if you could talk, you know, from your own experience, why it was so important in this case to imagine into your mind. As children, we have very little access to the lives of our parents. You know, they are parents. My mom was always my mom. And for me, it was important to find about the woman. When she died, I went through that closet looking for something juicy, you know, a lover <laughs> or something, you know, something secret, you know, stash of pornography. I don't know. <laughs> I want a grit. I want. I wanted something that would make her something other than my mom. I found nothing. I found nothing. And I think in writing, I gave my mom the womanness that I miss from her. Yeah, and that's why it was important to imagine the honeymoon, the first night with dad, um, all the trips that they did together so that I could see her as a human being, as a woman, rather than a mother. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do your sisters feel about you writing about your mom in that way? Do they, they like what you sort of discovered about her, or did they feel protected? They don't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> It was all part of the plan. Oh, that's the truth. <laughs> How long did you have to give yourself before you could take on a project like that? I started writing about my mom's funeral probably a couple of days after she died. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To get down the actual. And, and it got really, I don't want to call it morbid, because everyone has a different way to, to deal with loss. I wanted to learn about rigor mortis. I wanted to be able to understand what was going on in my mom's body. Mm -hmm. And it's full of enzymes and secretions and stiffness, and I wanted all of that. Mm -hmm. If I understood what was going on in my mom's body, I thought I was better off than my sisters, because at least I knew what was going on. Right? Mm -hmm. They were mourning, and I was mourning too, but I was mourning from a very different corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were, they were missing her, they felt her loss, and I was doing the same thing, but I just got very scientific about it. I just wanted to know what was going on to her body, the body that I was not going to hug ever again. I wanted to understand the physical loss. Did, did you get a sense of relief? I don't or know if that's uh, one one of the chapters, everything else was, you know, it was very from my heart. But probably the only chapter that gave me that sense of, you know, that revelation, it was a chapter that I wrote about finding out that I had been an unwanted child. Which was not a surprise because, you know, I was number six and my mom was very poor. And I, you know, I was like, I knew she didn't want to have six kids. But it was like, you know, it was like, well, I'm a mother, I'm grown up. So we are more like, you know, we are on the same, same level. Like, hey, mom, you remember when you were pregnant with me? Was, oh, my God, it was awful. And I'm thinking like... <laughs> I don't know what I expected. I, I wanted the truth, but she just gave it to me between the eyes, like, oh. yeah. So that, that was a pretty hard chapter. Although I knew that I had been unwanted. You know, just writing about it and coming to terms with the fact that I was no part of anyone's plan um, was, um, was hard. Yeah. Did you consider that you were a victim of 
consult your sisters at all when you were writing it? Like, I can imagine there were times where maybe you wanted, it, like, you were looking for a detail that you couldn't explain, or you wanted a different perspective to talk to them at all about it? Yeah. Um, here's the thing. When I attended an MFA program for about three weeks, <laughs> right? <laughs> and in one of the workshops, it became apparent that everyone had a fantastic story to write. Right? And we were talking about our lives. It's like, oh my God, there's so much there and there's so much here. And his life and her life is like amazing. And I had nothing. I had a very ordinary childhood. Nothing happened to me. It was, we were just poor and loving. And it was just, you know, trying to make it from Sunday to Monday. Nothing special. And um, I voiced this during one of the workshops. And Ira, um, said, surely you have a memory from childhood. Think hard of something really special. I'm thinking, well, I don't know if this counts as special, but my sister brought a skeleton home. Is that kind of special? <laughs> and I was like, what? And there you have it. Um, she needed an A in anatomy, and the nuns say we need a skeleton, so she just went and bought a body and brought it home, and we cooked it. We peeled the guy at home. And we put it together, and it was like a family project. It was like a <laughs> it was <laughs> it was very bonding. <laughs> Not only did we put the guy together, we kept the guy with us for a long time. So he was in the middle of a living room, and then it was blocking the only window because it was a shotgun style uh, little apartment. So it was covering the window, so my mom moved it to the bathroom. And every time we went into the restroom, we had to spread the legs apart. Because we were just in there. And so, well, maybe I do have something. <laughs> But, I, you know, it only goes to tell you that you do have a story. You always have a story to tell, right? Yeah, go ahead. I loved when you described that you wanted to search the womanness of, you know, your own mother. Mm -hmm. The woman that you feel so close because she's been there from your childhood all the way to the adulthood. And rather recently, I've been trying to find out who my mother I mean, she's still alive, but I still want to know. Mm -hmm. Before she had me, before she had any interaction with me, mm -hmm. I want to know who that woman was. Yeah, yeah. And I feel in some way that I have robbed what she could have potentially become. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in that way, I do feel guilty. And I, I wish I could say, you know, if it wasn't part of a plan, you know, I asked her one day that if you had a choice and you know it ahead of time, which not have me, and she said, I'll trade everything in the world and I don't care about my success. Mm -hmm. I just want to become a mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that part spoke to me because I've been desperately trying to search of my mother's past. Mm -hmm. But she would always hide away and say, mm -hmm. right, right. That's part of a past that you don't need to know mm -hmm. because it's not important. Because I was a lost yeah. But we were talking about this earlier on. Sometimes all you have to do is ask, you know. And they're very likely to say, this is all in the past. Don't worry about it. What matters is 1970 and on, right? But um, maybe ask on a Monday. Maybe ask again on Wednesday. <laughs> maybe ask again when it's full moon. And <laughs> little by little. The thing is, though, she's quite strong. You know, persuade her, and, and I did try up to a certain mm. month. But one thing I have realized is, if I could somehow get it, and, but I don't want to violate mm -hmm. what she had done. It's just, it's like asking someone to do great favor, but I don't want to violate that. Favor. Yeah. Well, I can understand that and boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. I'm about, oh, I didn't know this. Sorry. You can yeah, take turns. Oh, yeah. <laughs> boundaries. Um, you share so much, and I'm wondering if you ever had to sort of talk with yourself about how much am I going to All share the time. about my life. Is All it, the time. Yeah. All the and time. Do you ever feel like, oh, I wish I hadn't 
on there, or maybe I put out too much? Or? With praying alone in Qatar, mm -hmm. it was just so, oh, it's like everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't talk about food because I couldn't find where to put it, but I would have. You know, I just <laughs> wanted to dump everything there. Mm -hmm. When the piece got accepted by the son, I went, oh no, oh no. And to make matters worse, the little bit that was available online was the sex part, which was the one that I didn't want anyone to read. But, you know, I have said this before, this is like playing, when you are, when you write memoir, you're playing street poker. Right? You can get squeamish when you're in your panties. It's like, a well, well, I changed my mind. You know, I'm not going to go all the way. If you're not willing, I, I, I think it's valid. You know, if you're not willing to take your panties off, strip poker is not for you. <laughs> sure. So you play something that is safer. Yeah? And, and I, yeah, yeah, there you go, there you go. But um, that's the really cool thing about writing memoir, you know, that you are willing to put yourself on the page naked and vulnerable for everyone to see, for everyone to scrutinize you. And you're just there. And, and there is a lot of beauty to it, to that willingness to surrender to the judgment of strangers. You know, once one is written down, it's, it's done. You, you have no control over how people perceive you over all the, all the things that you write. Your life is there. And I think, you know, the reality, just the flip side, is that I would never be able to do it. But as a reader or a listener, there's such a feeling of gratitude yeah. that somebody else has put out so much of what we all have experienced mm -hmm. and to sort of validate and make okay all the you know, ups and downs and the yeah. crazy stuff of our lives that we generally don't talk about. Yeah, but you know, but you're right. I mean, there is no way to, well, at least for me, to know when too much, when, when something is too much. You know, am I saying too much of this? Should I just tone it down? Does the reader need to know this? And for me, the answer is always like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course the reader wants to know that. <laughs> But it's just me. It's just me. And I, and I always struggle with this. I always wonder, do I need to say this? Do I need to go there? And it's, sometimes it's pretty hard to... Th there are some things that I don't write about that are off limits, like my children. And even then, I have gone there a few times. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really love the way you... I, I've been around people who, who are dying, and who have died, and the way you describe your mother dying externally, mm -hmm. and then you juxtapose it with her internal world. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so beautiful, and, mm -hmm. and you don't usually, I don't think I've ever heard anyone juxtapose those things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, somebody's writing about death, it's, you know, death of the body, unless you're, you know, Carlos Castaneda or something. And you know, <laughs> you're not, you don't, there's no spiritual part, and I thought it was very beautiful. So Thank I, you. Yeah, thank you. Unusual. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, I wasn't sure of the timeline. Did your mom ever know that you were published of any piece of work? Never. No. No, she had Alzheimer's when she died, so I don't think uh, it would have made any difference. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure of the timeline. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you talk a lot about finding your voice. Mm -hmm. Wait, at what point do you realize that you found, found it? Ask me an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> do you like tomatoes and strawberries? <laughs> strawberries. <next. laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. I think you just have to go with your gut feeling. You know when you own what you write. You know it. When, when, you, when you open the manuscript and you read this piece and you can hear yourself and you, and you know that it comes from the heart. And it's not only heart. You know, the voice needs style and structure and all those little things. But you can have the structure. You can learn this in the program. You can have structure and the, the punctuation and the musicality and all that and no heart. And the story doesn't go anywhere. You know. You know, and you just have to be very humble 
in this business just open your heart and your mind to criticism to suggestions to edits just 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 open yourself just open yourself and just take it all in mm -hmm. and uh, the worst thing that we can do as writers is to fall madly in love with our words and say I refuse mm -hmm. to delete this because I really like that mm -hmm. forget it I mean you just need to be humble and say maybe it doesn't belong here if it's really good, you save it for another essay, yeah, and you recycle, you revisit later on. But um, in that process of being opening and accepting people's suggestions and accepting your weaknesses, you find your own voice. You'll know, you'll know. Mm -hmm. It's like when you go shopping for a dress. What are you looking for? <laughs> I don't know, you know, I'll know when I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I got one more question, maybe? What are you working on now? Sex. <laughs> no, I'm, again, I'm combining anthropology with literary journalism, and I'm working on a, a cross-cultural exploration of the symbolic meaning of hymen and how women lose their virginities in different cultures. Yeah, that's what I'm working on at the moment. Yeah. Uh, we have been, we've been talking. There've been some comments about you know the vulnerability and the, the sense of exposure in, in memoir, and and I think what Adriana does that's so exceptional, which is I think what what, what I'm feeling certainly touched by, is it's not it's it's yes it's those things as well, but it's her ability to use language in such a delicate mm -hmm. and nuanced way that the intimacy feels even richer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I just felt like there needed to be an awareness. It's not just because she's exposing these very mm -hmm. private and intimate moments, it's because of how she's doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. if, if I could piggyback on that, the other thing, I was, as I was listening, because I'm sometimes sensitive to some of that, it's not ego-driven to me at all. It never seemed like it was about, um, I just want to be out there. I want to look. I want people to look at me or anything like that. It real. It seems so connected and grounded in such honesty, and that that's why it, to me it's so compelling. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure. Okay. I'm, um, okay. <laughs> but um, I noticed that when I was growing up here, being different was in a way that it reverted. It, you know, unwantedness. Do you ever have to feel? something was different from what most people have expected you to be. You mean here in in the States? Yes. For being Latina? Yes. Um, when I applied to to the, the graduate program at USF, I asked the director of the program, you, do you think, because um, English is not my native language, that I stand a chance of being accepted? And she said, no. We say we have never had anyone who's not a native speaker of English. Uh, but send your samples, you know, they're anonymous, so everyone is going to be reading, you know, a, a manuscript, a, um, what do you call um, a piece, but no one is going to know the name. And based on my writing, I got accepted, which told me that I don't have an accent when I write, which is excellent, right? <laughs> you don't want to read. Um, stuff with an accent. <laughs> but um, that to me was very interesting mm -hmm. and that is probably the only time where I've had that kind of thing with language. Um, other than that, life has been just incredibly generous. You know, it's like all the stars align themselves and everything is just, it's been really good. It's been really good, and people have been very welcoming. It, don't take me wrong, some of the critics have been brutal. And the problem with writing memoir is that <coughs> you invite people's opinions about your life. I want you mm -hmm. to appreciate or critique or love or hate my work, not me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I have one of the, one of one women who reviewed my book said that, um, um, it was a really difficult book to read because it's very depressing and it talks a lot about death. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> okay, I, that one, whatever. But one of the reviewers um, accused me, and I felt that as an accusation of abandoning my mom. And she said that, right, that, that once I found out that she was ill, I should have stayed in Colombia, and instead I went as far away as possible, and I moved to Kuwait, to um, Alaska, abandoning my mom. And that, that was pretty harsh. Mm -hmm. Like, how mm -hmm. dare you? Yeah. Just focus on my writing. Mm -hmm. Is it good? Is it not good? Do not judge my actions. But you can't control that. Mm -hmm. Once you publish something, you are under scrutiny, just like Asman put me there. Ha, 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 ha.